Thank you. So hello everyone. I'm glad you joined uh, our presentation today. <clears throat> I know that uh, for many people Polish genealogy is a little bit complicated and it's hard to talk about all the aspects within uh, the time that we've got. But uh, based on the requests we get from people, um, I will try to focus on the things that seem to be the most confusing for Americans tracing their Polish heritage. Um, we'll quickly go through the history of Poland, just focusing on the most important aspects. <clears throat> then uh, I'll tell you what to do to locate, to identify and to find out the exact place of origin of your ancestors in Poland. I will shortly explain uh, where to search for the vital records in Poland. Uh, and I will also um, tell you a little bit about the research beyond the records. So what additionally can be done except of just searching for vital or any other records in Poland. Uh, so let's quickly uh, go through the history of Poland. Let's let's start with that. Uh, as you know, uh, Poland has a very complicated history. Our borders changed a lot. We've lost our independence for over 100 years and disappeared from the map of Europe. We went through two world wars and so on. It all has a big influence on uh, who we are th at the moment, and it also has a big impact on the genealogy and genealogy research. This is one of the main factors why Polish genealogy is uh, so complicated for many people. Um, let's just start with one event with the birth of Poland, the baptism of Poland, which is uh, heard as a symbolic event that was the beginning of the Polish state and actually the Polish Catholic Church as well. It's the baptism of Poland, that, that name of this historical event, actually refers to the ceremony when the first ruler of the Polish state, Mieszko I, got baptized. Uh, according to the to most of the historians, the exact date was April 14th, 966. So we believe or we consider that date as the beginning of the Polish country, of the Polish uh, state. Now we're going to skip a few centuries and stop for a while in the year 1569 and 16th century. It is when the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was established by the Union of Lublin that uh, took place in July 1569. Uh, two countries, the crown of the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania united to create one of the largest countries in Europe. In fact, that uh, first already the personal union between these two countries before, already in the late 1300s, when the Polish Queen Hedwig or Jadwiga in Polish she got married to the Lithuanian Duke, who was then crowned as the King of Poland and used the name Władysław uh, the Second Jagiełło. The reason I'm talking about it, the reason I, I mentioned that, is that uh, at that point of time, Poland and Lithuania, so the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, was one of the largest countries uh, in Europe. Uh, not only by the, the, the territory, but also by the number of population, the multi-ethnic population of almost 12 million people. Um, basically, when we talk about Polish genealogy, we consider almost all of that area. Um, the next screen, I'm showing you the map of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth back then. So this is the map from uh, late 1600s when Poland uh, was the largest. It was it covered almost 400,000 square meters. Nowadays it's uh, just 
twelve uh, hundred thousand. So it's about twenty five percent of uh, the previous of the previous uh, territory. And right now, if you're able to watch uh, what I'm showing here, it's the the current territory of Poland is around here. And uh, nowadays we've got Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. So if you take a look at the current map of Europe, you would see uh, five countries that used to be the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth back then. Uh, as I mentioned, the population was multi-ethnic. We had a lot of different ethnic groups, what also has a very big impact and big influence on our genealogy and our heritage. Uh, the next very important chapter in our history is related to three partitions of Poland. Uh, the name three partitions, uh, I just shortly explained that, does not refer to uh, the three countries that took part in that event. It refers to the fact that there were three times when uh, Poland, when the territory of Poland was taken over by another country. The first one uh, in 1772, then several years later in 1793, and the last one, 1795. In 1795, Poland completely disappeared from the map of Europe. On that picture, on the drawing uh, you've got uh, on your screen, we can see that it's a comic picture of that situation. We've got the Emperor of Russia, Catherine II, then we've got the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, Emperor Joseph II, and we also have got uh, the King of Prussia, Frederick II, and of course the Polish king who has already lost uh, his crown. Uh, so, so this was very tragic, tragic, and and uh, definitely not. It was the end of Poland for 123 years. When we take a look at the map of these partitions, it's a very useful one because. Uh, People often ask what what actually these three partitions were. So um, let me explain it that way. The first one that uh, happened in 1772, you can see that Russia took a part of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is the current territory of Latvia, Belarus, and a piece of Ukraine. So it was that part. Then the Prussia took just a small piece of the country with access uh, to the Baltic Sea, and the Austrians uh, took some part uh, of Poland in, in the eastern, in the, uh, sorry, in the south uh, eastern part of the country. Then in the several years later, in 1793, Russia took an additional piece of the land. Uh, Prussians did the same. Austria did not participate in the second partition. And uh, by the third partition in 1795, they each of these three countries took an additional piece of land. And as a result, Poland completely disappeared from the map of uh, Europe. Um, we regained our independence, as you probably know, in 1918. Uh, over 100 years ago, but for 123 years, there's no Poland. Most likely, your ancestors uh, emigrated to the USA during that period of, of time when there's no such a country as Poland. Um, the reason I'm mentioning that is uh, that it makes, very often, it makes people confused. Because as you can see on the examples here, um, people are not sure about their nationality or their country of origin. So all the examples that I'm going to show you refer to people who were born in the current or former territory of Poland. 
but in their record you won't really see any mention about Poland as the country. So for example here you have a German person whose uh, country of origin is listed as Russia. The last place of residence is listed as Russia. In fact it was Poland. Uh, when we talk about the Polish genealogy, of course, we cannot uh, forget about the Jewish population. In some of the towns, it was even over 50% of population was Jewish. So in um, records referring to that group of people, you can see the, their nationality listed as Hebrew, country of origin, Russia. But this is again Poland. Uh, on another example, we've got a person whose birthplace is listed as Austria. It's misspelled, it definitely should be Austria. And additionally, we've got information about the religion of that person. It says Greek Catholic. And um, for us, it's very useful information, very valuable one, because it tells us that the person was uh, from the most likely from the current territory of Ukraine because Greek Catholics living in Austria, this was um, an ethnic group that is called Ruthenians or Lemkos. You might have heard of them, and I believe there is uh, another example of uh, that group of people. Uh, yes, exactly here. The nationality. Uh, or the country of which citizen or subject. It's Austria Galici, so known as Galicia. The race of people is listed as Ruthenians, country Galici, and then the town is given. But still, this is about the person who came from Poland. This is uh, the people with the, uh, this is the that record refers to person uh, with Polish heritage, without a doubt. Then uh, the same record uh, referring to the same person says place of birth, country, Galicia. Galicia is uh, the name of the part of Poland that was under Austro-Hungarian control. So again, we know that this person was actually Polish, but you don't really see um, the name Poland anywhere, except of example, um, this document here on the top of the page, when the nationality says Russia, but race of people Polish. So the, the, the reason I mention that is uh, people are very often confused with the information, say, oh, I, I don't think I've got Polish heritage. The name sounds Polish, but all the documents say that my grandfather was from Austria. So that's not necessarily the truth that he was from Austria. Most likely, that person was from Poland, from the part of the country that was under um, control of um, Austrians. Um, to summarize, it's it's always worth to learn a bit about the Polish history, about the, especially about the region your ancestors came from, to have the better understanding of their nationality. Um, so. To give an idea, re recently we worked on a case when a man who had a typically Polish surname believed that his family was from Vienna. We started to search for various information regarding that and we found out that the only reason that uh, he thought that his ancestors were from Vienna was that some of documents were saying about Austria. And since Vienna is the current capital of Austria, that family started to believe and, 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 and kept saying, okay, my ancestors came from Vienna. In fact, they were from the little town near Krakow, where 100% of Polish heritage. Okay, let's go back to the genealogy research. Um, so let's assume that you already know you've got Polish heritage. Not necessarily your ancestors came from the either current or the former territory of Poland. They're not necessarily Polish, but uh, that's where they came from. So it's time to learn an exact location. 
why? First of all, the reason you are joining our presentation today is that you are interested in genealogy. So it's like going one step further back, finding out an exact place, an exact location, the town or a village your ancestors came from. Then another thing, uh, you need to know an exact location to be able to go any further with your research. Uh, in general, there's no one database where you can just enter the name and surname of your ancestor and it's going to give you the results where that person came from. You need to know at least the area or the more you know, the better. But that's going to be definitely helpful in a better research. Um, it's also important that you confirm what you know, that you do the fact check because there are a lot of mistakes in people family trees and I will short, shortly go back to that uh, subject um, because people very often put some information on in their family trees or on their profiles on ancestry.com and other services without proving it. Uh, so confirming that your information is correct is also a very important step, very important part of uh, the genealogy research. Uh, another reason um, for finding or locating the exact place of origin of your ancestors is that you might be able to pass that information to further generations, to your children, to your grandchildren. Nowadays, maybe not uh, right now with the pandemic situation, but People travel a lot and uh, sometimes we hear from our customers, oh, I was in Krakow or in Warsaw a few times and I wish I knew that my family was from that particular town located just an hour drive from Warsaw because I missed an opportunity to visiting it. So some people think, okay, I've got Polish heritage, I'll go and I'll see Częstochowa, Warsaw, Krakow and maybe a few more major cities, but they miss an opportunity to see their real uh, homeland, their ancestral village. So it's just another reason of uh, going further with your research. And now the most important question, um, you may want to um, find the answer for that, is how to do that, how to find and locate an exact place of origin of your ancestors. So first of all, obviously, you can use various databases. Mm, the most common one is Ancestry.com, but if you don't have access to it, you can try Family Search or Ellis Island website. In general, we believe that Ship Manifest is uh, usually the most reliable source of information because when people mm, were entering United States, this is the first document that they filled. This is the first time they were asked about their place of origin. So we usually find the ship manifest as the most valuable and we, if, if for example, um, someone asks us and doesn't know much about uh, his or her Polish heritage, by having the name and approximate year of birth or year of immigration, we try to find the ship manifest that usually lists the place of uh, origin. Um, then you can also go through some documents that are in your possession, like the old letters, uh, the envelopes of the letters sent to your ancestors, sent to your grandparents or sent to those who emigrated by the families uh, that stayed in Poland. It's also very valuable um, piece of information. You can also always uh, take advantage of the free preliminary research that a lot of genealogy research companies offer, like we do. So for example, when uh, people send us information about their ancestors, we spend about 30 minutes trying to analyze them, trying to find the place, trying to confirm if the information they've got are, is correct. 
So it's always beneficial to get in touch with uh, the researcher, even if you are not willing to go any further or, or have uh, the professional research done by someone. It's always worth to try, worth to see if what you've got is correct. Mm. Okay, assuming that we have a document saying the name of the town, it's time to prove it's correct and locate that place. The reason I shared that screen with you that comes from Ellis Island uh, website is that in th there was a general tendency to give the name of the bigger town or the biggest town in the area of origin rather than giving the exact name, rather than giving the exact location of one's birth. Pretty much the same situation um, occurs right now. For example, if you live in a, there's a town called Woodburn close to Fort Wayne, Indiana. I just Googled it before the presentation. So if, if, if you are from that Woodburn town, that is, as I can see, much smaller than Fort Wayne, you'd probably, if, if, if you meet me somewhere in Europe and I ask you, where are you from? You'd probably tell me I'm from Fort Wayne or I'm from Indiana, something like that. You won't tell me I'm from Woodburn, assuming that I have no idea where that place is located. Exactly the same happened when your ancestors entered the, the port of Ellis Island or any other mm, place. When they were asked by an officer, very often in foreign language, where are you from? They would say, I'm from Krakow, I'm from Warsaw. They would just list any bigger town. That is why in the majority of cases, I would say that in 80% of cases, when our customers or potential customers tell us, well, my family is from Krakow, in 80% they're not from Krakow. They could be from the town located 100 miles away from Krakow, but since it's the most recognizable one, they would give that name. Also, uh, sometimes the last place of residence and birthplace is not the same. People used to move a lot, especially in uh, central Poland, in the current area of Warsaw. Uh, people used to walk from village to village, searching for jobs, searching for better opportunities, etc. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So if in some of the records, uh, for example, the ship manifests tells you the name of the last place of residence, be aware that it's not uh, necessary their place of birth. Um, another thing that I would like to tell you about are the misspellings and um, finding out the correct names of the places. Like here on that example, you can see that that person was uh, born in Austria in the city spelled as U-Z-E-L. And what's important, there's no such a place as Uzel, U-Z-E-L. That person, the majority of people emigrating to the United States, especially from Galicia, from south uh, eastern part of Poland, majority of people were illiterate. Even they knew how to spell the name of their town, there's no way for them to verify if the person putting down that name did that correctly. That's why there are so many misspellings in the records. By having additional information about uh, that particular person, about that uh, surname, we, in that case, were able to identify that this place was actually Huzele, H-U-Z-E-L-E. -E. So the person putting that name down just missed the first and the last uh, letter from the name of the town. Um, there are also some other sources of, of important information, um, like the place of one's origin. These are other documents, like World War draft cards, centralization records, marriage or death records. But it's important to focus on the documents that refer to those who emigrated 
from Poland to the US. And the older the record is, the better chances you've got that the information is accurate. So very often the death records from people who died in, who emigrated in late 1800s or early 1900s and died, let's say, in 1950s, their place of birth would be listed just as Poland. So it's not enough. We need to, we need to then spend more time trying to find an exact location. Uh, also, another source of information are the old family photos, old letters, and other notes. Um, it was very popular to put uh, either some kind of information on the reverse and the back side of the photo. So please be aware of it if you've got a photo album, for example. Make sure that there is no information on the reverse side. And in, on that example, we've got a man sitting, and he just uh, sent this picture uh, to my dear brother, and he puts the name of the town, Stanislavov, and the date. And as far as I remember that case that we worked on some years ago, uh, it was the only source. This is how we found out where that person was from. Uh, Okay, let's uh, think, let's focus on locating your ancestral hometown because let's imagine that you've got the name of the town. Now it's time to locate it on the current map to find the exact location. There are basically two issues. One, the first one, which is the biggest challenge, except of the misspellings, is uh, the change of the name of the town or village. It particularly refers to the towns and villages that are currently in Lithuania, Ukraine, or Belarus, and that name got changed, uh, not completely, but a little bit. On that example, we've got the village of Datyniany. This is uh, the map you can see on the bottom, is the pre-war map from probably early 1900s, when that place was still called called uh, Datyniany. Right now, located in uh, Lithuania, it's called Dotenai, which is sounds pretty much the same, but if you try to find it in a Google map and you type in Datyniany, you most probably, you won't find it. Uh, so that, that that's one of the things, and I'd like to show you a very useful tool, very useful website for um, to to figure out where that place is located. Uh, you've got the address of that website: www.kami.net.plkresi. This website is available also in English. You can just um, type in the name of the place, your ancestors, or the place you are looking for. Um, if there are no results, then you can just go to Soundex mode. It's going to show you more results. And by clicking search, you'll probably get the list of the names of the towns with the pre-war map. And based on that, you can try to uh, you can use it to, 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 to locate that place on the current maps, on Google Maps, for example. Um, as far as German names are concerned, uh, and the part of the country that was under German control during the times of partitions, there's another very useful website. It's called kartenmeister.com. You can enter the German city name here and submit, and it's going to show you what the Polish name used to be, or you can do the reverse. It's going also to tell you the county, uh, you'll get the, even the GPS coordinates, sometimes the link to the Google map. Mm, so this is a very useful tool to locate that place. Uh, another 
thing that might uh, be challenging to locate the place of origin is that there are a lot of places in Poland that have exactly the same name. So, for example, you may have a little village called uh, Mała Wieś, which is literally little village, and there would be probably 20 or 30 places in Poland with that name. So then again, looking, for example, at the ship manifest, if you see that that person was uh, from Russia, from Nova Wieś, or the Mała Wieś, small village in Russia, then you may be sure that it's somewhere in the central Poland, by all means not in the western Poland or southern Poland, because it's at Russia. So it's, it's important to make sure that uh, you not only found the name of that place, but that you're also able to locate that place on the current map, so to actually know the uh, location. I had a situation three or four years ago, we're in Vilnius and the family wanted to see the village of Andrzejówka. I didn't do their research for them, they did their own research and they said, okay, there is a town uh, close to Vilnius, like one hour drive north, let's go there. That's where my grandparents came from. And I started to be a little bit annoying asking them if that's for sure the truth. And after like a short conversation, we found out, I, I actually found out that the Andrzejówka, where grandfather was from, is like six hour drive, completely different direction towards Warsaw. So we skipped that and we drove to Warsaw instead of that. So they were just not aware of the fact that there, are, that there might be another place called Andrzejówka uh, in Poland. So it's it's very important to not only learn, but also to identify, to locate that place. Uh, the next step in your Polish genealogy research is to learn what parish, what Jewish community, or what registry of vital records your ancestral village belonged to. These two databases that I mentioned might be useful as well. Um, on that screen, you can see the results of the Kartenmeister website. If you put the German name Kalisz, you'd get the Polish name, you'll get the name of the county, you'd get the name of the German province, of the today's province, the GPS coordinates, even the link to the Google Maps. But uh, what's particularly important in terms of the genealogy research is that thanks to that website we can learn that Kalish belonged to the Lutheran parish in Lipush, that there was also a Catholic parish in Lipush, and that uh, the civil registry was located in Dimianen. Then if you use another website that I showed you, this uh, kami.net, and if you type in the name of Kwapówka, uh, sorry, the, the village of Kwapówka, it's going to tell you that it used to belong to the Roman Catholic parish in Widełka. For those who can read Polish, you can also um, use an old geographical dictionary of Poland that usually tells you what Roman Catholic or what Greek Catholic parish that particular village uh, belonged to. Uh, okay, so assuming that we already know your ancestors are Polish, we found out uh, the name of the village they came from, we identified that place, we learned what parish, what uh, uh, registry office it belonged to, now it's time to search for the vital records, for birth, marriages, or death records from that uh, place. So the, I always suggest and recommend to start with state archives. State ar archives are located in the majority of bigger Polish towns and they all have unique collections 
part of that is digitalized. Uh, about 25 up to 30 percent is already available online. And in these archives, as far as the vital records are concerned, you may access the records that are older than 100 years for birth records and 80 years for marriage and death records. In order to see if a Polish third archive and which of them has the collection of records you're interested in, you can use the two most common, the, the most common website that's called Search the Archives. If you type in Search the Archive or Search the Polish Archives Poland, it's going to give you these two links. Search the Archives literally is Szukaj w Archiwach. There are actually two versions of this website, an old one and the new one. The new one has been here for, I guess, over a year, maybe even more than that, maybe two years. But sometimes um, the old version might have some records that are not available on the new one. So I always recommend for those who want to do their research on their own, I usually recommend to check both of them. And it's important to mention that the new version, which ends with uh, gov.pl, uh, only the, the, the new records or the new collections are added only to that new website, not to the, to the old version. Um, as far as the parish records are concerned, the vital records, you may also find them in diocesan or archdiocesan archives. There are also several archives like that in Poland. Some are very user-friendly, some are less user friendly. Uh, definitely you need to know what diocese uh, the particular parish belonged to. Um, there is no one general rule how you can access that information. In some of them you can take pictures, you can browse as many books as you want. In some you can only browse the books but you cannot take a picture or make a copy. Uh, in some of them, you can only see five books per day. Some of them would respond to your request and by email. Some require traditional letters and by snail mail, etc. Then uh, we also have got civil registry offices that keep uh, latest records, usually not older than 80 or 100 years. As you may assume uh, the civil registry offices give their books, their, hand them over to the state archives after they are old enough, after they are 80 years for, birth, for, for marriages and deaths and 100 for birth records. These uh, civil registry offices were actually founded just after World War II in 1945 but they were missing the pre-war data, therefore they requested and they got some records uh, mainly from parishes or from diocesan or archdiocesan archives. Um, it does not mean that if these records were given by the parish to the civil registry office that the parish has nothing, because it's important to mention that uh, since 1800s, Vital records in Poland were supposed to be written in two copies. So very often we may find the originals in the parish and the copies, the duplicates in either the state archives or the civil registry offices. Um, accessing records in civil registry offices a little bit more complicated as according to the Polish privacy law only the um, close family, so, so if you're related to the person you're searching for in a direct line, you can access that information. So you can search for your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, etc., but not really for great-uncles. But of course there are some ways of accessing that information as well. Mm, some of the books may also be found in the parishes, in the local church, and one more thing, um, 
contrary to popular belief, uh, if, for example, the church got destroyed during the World War II, or especially the Jewish synagogues, the majority of them got destroyed during the World War II, and if the records were kept there, these books disappeared. And people very often believe it's over. I've heard that the church burned. The, the priests I, I talked, I sent a letter or someone from my family talked to the local priest who said, all the records are gone. But you don't know if these records, if the second copy did not survive. It might have been kept in a completely different place and might be still available. And the local priest might even not know about that. Um, accessing records in uh, local parishes is a bit more complicated, and it's a very individual case depending on uh, how the. It actually depends on the priest. If priests want to share information, they would. In some parts of the country, especially in the southeastern part of the country, they are not allowed to, and they always tell you try to search for these books, for these records in the Archdiocesan archive that you cannot really access. But um, I know that some people try to put some few dollars in the letter and send it over to the priest. First of all, you don't know if that priest speaks English and can read your letter and answer it. Um, if, it's, if, if, if that priest has some interest in genealogy and is really helpful, might respond, but in majority of cases, this request or these letters hardly ever get uh, responded. In some of the cases, uh, vital records might be found in local museums or in local libraries, but it's rather rare. It's, it, it doesn't happen too often because these records should have should have been given to the civil registry office and then to the state archives. Another source are the uh, LDS microfilms. As you probably know, the Mormons did a lot of uh, filming. They filmed a lot of vital records in Poland, but their activity here in Poland stopped in late 1980s. And since then, a lot of books were given to the state archives. So definitely Polish state archives have more records than the Mormons have. Sometimes we hear from people, oh, I, I went to Salt Lake City, I was in their library, I went through all the uh, available records, there's nothing else for me to be found. It's not necessarily the truth. In many cases, we can always use the second copies or we can always, we, we usually have more records that are available in Polish uh, archives. Um, actually, locating where the records are kept is a milestone during the research. Uh, okay, I'm just showing you here an exemplary birth record, and the reason I'm showing it is that probably you may be able to find some of that information referring to that particular person for example, in, on Ancestry.com or on Family Search, there are a lot of databases that uh, has entries, including that, that name. But getting or accessing the original record is very important because you can find out additional information. If you find an entry in the database, you'd only learn that it was Juliana born in 1887, and you would find what her parents' names were. By getting or accessing the original record, you may find out that the person was born in a village of Novopole in a house number 15. You'd also learn the grandparents' name because this is how um, her parents were are identified by the names of their parents. So you have one more generation. You also have the names of the godparents that might be some members of their families as well. Um, on that example here, you also have uh, occupation, that particular man, Laurentius Butchko, was, uh, he was a bricklayer. So just additional information you may find, um, an added value that you can get by seeing the original records rather, rather than just a database. 
Uh, okay, let's let's imagine that you already have your family tree nicely done. You might have it printed, painted on the wall, on the picture, etc. But there is still a lot of additional information you may be able to find out. For example, you know the names, the dates, but you might have wondered what happened to the siblings of your ancestors who did not emigrate and stayed in Poland or Ukraine or Belarus. Uh, you may be thinking if there are any living relatives in Poland. These are the questions we hear quite often. And thanks to the on-site research provided by, by the local researchers, you might actually find them. And living relatives are a great source of information. Um, sometimes during that kind of on-site research, we are able to locate the house, the original building, if still exists, uh, find the address where your ancestors used to live. It's especially um, we're especially successful with uh, southeastern part of Poland. Uh, because these uh, vital records from Galicia, from Austria, that I just showed you an example of, contain the house number. But also the living relatives might know, okay, you know, I just recall that my great-grandfather, which is automatically your great-grandfather, that's your common ancestor, lived in that house on the other side of the street. And uh, by learning that, you can, we can, take a picture, you can, uh, if you find it out, you can even go to the street view on Google Maps and see the exact location where your ancestors used to live before they left uh, Poland. Uh, what we also sometimes do, and I think it's very useful and uh, people really enjoy seeing that, is uh, finding the graves of your mm, forefathers. Uh, sometimes we're asked to check the cemeteries and see if there are any graves left. In general, there, there, there's no one general database where you can type in the name of your great-grandparents and see what cemetery that person is buried in. But, uh, and, and moreover, the death records do not contain information about the place of burial. Therefore, again, the living relatives are very valuable source of information because they may actually know where someone from their family is buried. In many cases, you just need to walk from grave to grave and try to find something. Uh, by finding living relatives, we can again see the old pictures. Imagine that you've got uh, the name and date of birth of someone in your family tree. But uh, how about seeing that uh, person's face? That's something really incredible. Uh, and you won't be able to find any of these pictures in any of the archives. It's usually in the private collection of some family members. Um, that kind of on-site research that I've just described can be done either by local researchers like us or can be also done during your visit in Poland. I know that right now it's not the best time for traveling, but uh, please be aware of the fact that a well-organized heritage tour is a unique experience you will never forget, and it's going to give you a great picture of what your ancestors looked like. It's like um, summarizing the hard work you did tracing your Polish ancestors. Um, so I think I'm coming to the end of, of my presentation. I just want to uh, thank you for, for your time. And uh, I really encourage you to contact me uh, after the presentation. If you have any concerns, any questions related to the to Polish genealogy, to Polish uh, history, if you are struggling with something, if you've hit the brick wall, we always uh, try to help people to answer their questions, not necessarily by um, providing the research for them, but when, when we do the 
free of charge preliminary research, you may also be able to find a lot about your ancestors. So I strongly encourage you to, to, to contact me, ask your questions. And I think we also have, uh, now we've got time for, for the questions. So thank you very much.